And I want to invite everyone, please introduce yourself in the chat, put your name, your location, and your church or organization so we can get to know each other a bit. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, we can see a little bit about what we'll be going through today. So we'll introduce Rafi and come to the table, um, our organization and our program. We'll look a bit at problems in food access and also how farms of color face discrimination and then how um, Rafi has been addressing these two different issues. Um, we'll explain the Farm and Faith Partnerships Project and then talk about ways that you and your faith community can get involved in partnerships. Um, so that's what we'll be doing today. Um, and so I'll share a little bit about Rafi. So Rafi is the Rural Advancement Foundation International USA, or Rafi for short. We were established in 1990. We are a nonprofit organization, a farm advocacy organization based in Pittsburgh. Um, Rafi's mission, we challenge the root causes of unjust food systems, supporting and advocating for economically, racially, and ecologically just farm communities. We envision a thriving, sustainable, and equitable food system where farmers and farm workers have dignity and agency, where they are supported by just agricultural policies, excuse me, and where corporations and institutions are accountable to their community. We address these ends through farm advocacy work, through our contract ag reform program, through our farmer's market access program, our farmer of color network, and through connecting with churches and faith communities through our come to the table program. So we have several, several different programs at RAFI. The main ones today that we're gonna be talking about are come to the table and farmer of color network. Um, so moving on to talk a bit more about come to the table. Um, so come to the table is a program within RAFI um, the purpose of Come to the Table is to end hunger by developing connections to create a just food system where food is a human right and those who work in the system have ownership and are treated with dignity. We believe that faith communities have a key role to play in this work. Come to the Table's primary strategy is connection. Um, we help connect other RAFI programs with non-farming communities, especially communities of faith. Um, and we hold events, conferences, and other gatherings to build connections between individuals, organizations, issues, and communities. Um, one exciting thing that's coming up is we will be hosting our eighth biannual Come to the Table conference in March of 2022, March 15th and 16th. It will be in Greenville, North Carolina, at the Greenville Convention Center. Our theme is spirit, power, and connection, owning our food future. We've got some great keynote speakers lined up. We're gonna be um, releasing our request for workshop proposals this summer. Um, so we're very excited about it. Um, participants will examine the root causes of hunger and lead with knowledge, skills, and connections to challenge the systemic nature of hunger and build a more just food system. So we're, we're very excited for that coming up. I'll pass it now to my coworker, Jared, to talk a bit about food access. Yeah, so many North Carolinians struggle to access food. Um, food deserts exist in both rural and urban areas. Um, and in the map shown uh, of North Carolina, you can see that the darker the shade of red, the higher the number of residents living in a food desert. Um, a food desert is defined by the USDA as a low income census tract in which at least 33% uh, or 500 people live more than a mile from a supermarket or grocery store in urban areas, or 10 miles from a supermarket or grocery store in rural areas. Um, and so according to that metric, North Carolina has at least 349 food deserts across 80 different counties, uh, which impacts about one and a half million residents uh, of North Carolina. Um, so when we talk about uh, why the, t the number of black farmers um, has dwindled, um, we can definitely see that there are specific uh, policies and practices uh, that have contributed to that um, and have kind of led us to where we are now with farmers of color. Um, one of the first contributing factors uh, historically is the Homestead Act. Um, according to the terms of the Homestead Act, enacted in 1862, 
any male adult American citizen and some women that had never fought against the United States government uh, was obliged to over 160 acres of land surveyed by the government if the requirements of cultivation were met. However, the Homestead Act was no remedy for poverty in the country. Most African-American low-class whites and Native Americans were landless, and this act failed to address their situations. Additionally, few farmers and laborers could meet the requirements of the act. Non-white communities like African-Americans were left out and did not benefit from the act, um, even once uh, many African-Americans were freed after the Civil War. Um, another contributing factor is the lynching trail. Um, racial segregation and violence in the United States uh, is often seen as a well-defined storyline. Uh, however, the significance of land as the drive for black lynching has been fundamentally disregarded. Uh, ac yeah, so according to uh, one particular historian, uh, affluent African-Americans and black property owners rose to become the target of white supremacist lynch mobs. Uh, in many instances, these attacks generated an extensive exodus of Black communities to areas that experienced less lynching, rendering many Blacks landless. Over 3,000 African Americans were lynched by these mobs between 1865 and 1965. And, they can, and the continued lynching of affluent Blacks rendered many jobless as the white lynching mobs uh, took over their properties and land. These acts were later fortified by the Jim Crow laws and the KKK movement uh, against any success in the Black community. Discriminatory policies like the Black Codes restricted African Americans from mixing with the white community and any slight contact would lead to these lynching incidences and eventual mass migration of Black communities to areas where these cases uh, were less common. As lynchings continued, more wealthy Black men and women lost their properties and land since they were the chief targets. Uh, another historical uh, policy and practice that was mentioned uh, in the Jamboard uh, is heirs property laws. Uh, during the period between the Civil War in 1865 and 1920, African Americans were granted land nearing about 20 million acres by federal and state governments. America had been historically hostile to African Americans and rejected any move by African Americans towards property ownership. Heirs' property is the home or land passed from one generation to the other with few forms of legally established documentation in the family system. For many, this form of ownership limited a family's capability to establish generational wealth. Heirs' property also prevents the efforts of individuals and various organizations uh, from helping to revitalize African-American neighborhoods. The original landowners used this system to participate in the early political life, a system they thought would positively impact future generations and their legacies. They expected that the ownership structure would create individual self-sufficiency and equal economic opportunity, um, as well as political and economic participation among their descendants. Instead, over the decades, land lost by generations of Black families through this process has been a vital roadblock to low-income families and communities in maintaining connection to their family history and culture. Families have lost land due to illegal actions of dishonest legal representatives, violence initiated against African-American landowners that aim at driving them from their properties, and racial discrimination from the USDA against Black and minority landowners. Um, and the final uh, historical uh, policy and practice uh, 
that we want to address is USDA discrimination and the Pickford versus Glickman case. Uh, so the Pickford versus Glickman case in 1999 was a legal complaint against the USDA uh, where black farmers accused the Department of Alleged Racial Discrimination against black communities and farmers when allocating farm grants and loans from 1981 to 1996. The case was settled in 1999 with over a billion dollars uh, being credited to over 13,000 black farmers from the lawsuit settlement period. Date, it remains the largest civil rights settlement uh, in United States history. And additionally, Congress has appropriated an additional 1.2 billion uh, under the second Pickford case in anticipation um, of additional lawsuits uh, and evidence for more discrimination. With intense pressure from small and local small and low income families owning farms, uh, African Americans have struggled to survive in Southern states. African Americans were segregated and could not access USDA loans. Community has also been segregated and disenfranchised by the Southern Black Codes, excluded from employment, political and legal systems, condition that has persevered for much of the 20th century into the 21st. With these laws, Black communities remain poor and cannot profit from their own farms. Due to lack of government and state support, many Black families have been forced to sell out or rent their farms to individuals who can access USDA loans. Uh, so we've just gone through several systemic and institutional ways that Black farmers have faced oppression and discrimination uh, during the course of American history over the, over the last uh, century or so. And it's important to note that these discriminations build on each other and have a compounding effect. So even if one of these issues was solved, uh, like in the case of Pickford v. Glickman, uh, in offering some restitution to some Black farmers, it certainly cannot undo the damage that has already been done and doesn't directly address uh, the systemic and systematic nature uh, of oppression. So uh, now that we uh, have been able to talk through uh, food access in North Carolina and the challenge that that presents uh, to both rural and urban North Carolinians, as well as the problem of racial land loss and the challenges uh, that farmers of color face. Uh, Michelle is going to talk us through some of the ways in which Rafi uh, is uniquely equipped to address this. Thanks, Jared. So yeah, we've talked a bit about some of the, the stark numbers in terms of food insecurity, in terms of racial land loss and discrimination that farmers of color have faced. Um, and especially also things have been particularly stark in this past year around the pandemic. Um, so come to the table in starting in March of 2020, we were able to offer many grants to churches that were in the community doing this great work of responding to increased hunger that was caused by the pandemic. Um, these mini grants were made possible through the support of the Duke Endowment, and they provided funding to churches that were purchasing food from local growers or local restaurants and then distributing them in their community. Um, so in this picture, you see Pastor Jason Layton at Calvary Memorial UMC um, over in Snow Hill in um, Greene County and he's assisting with food distribution here. Um, when Calvary Memorial received their grant, they were able to partner with three local farmers to purchase meat and produce. Um, one of the farms was actually the farm of a church member and the two other farms were community-based farms that the church members knew of. And they partnered with their local pre-K program to distribute food to students that the school social workers had identified as food insecure. 
Um, and so we think these mini grants have been really impactful for a few different reasons. Farmers, especially early on in the pandemic, were really hit hard. Um, you know, if they were normally doing agritourism or selling to schools or selling to restaurants, and even some farmers markets shut down for a bit. Um, so all of these traditional market streams were, were cut off. Um, and so farmers were in need of more income. Additionally, there were, you know, higher rates of unemployment. Um, more and more community members were facing um, food insecurity. And so these grants allowed churches to address both of these needs at once, to provide income to farmers who had been hurt by the pandemic while offering that food to neighbors who were in need of fresh, healthy food. So churches really um, doing that good work of connecting with others and, um, and helping out in their community. And so this example is really great because it shows the power of partnership and the power um, of how we are stronger when we're able to work together and make a bigger impact when we work together. Um, on our next slide, we'll learn a little bit about the Farmers of Color Network. Um, so this network was formed um, in 2017 to support farmers of color and grow their numbers. Um, the network provides farmer-led technical assistance and funding opportunities. It also hosts farm tours, networking events, and gatherings um, to explore ancestral traditions and knowledge, as well as explore market solutions for farmers of color. Um, and so you can see the Farmers of Color Network in 2020. We awarded um, infrastructure grants to over 25 farmers in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. And I'll add that in 2021, um, the network has awarded um, 50 grants to farmers in 10 states. Um, Another program that we have at RAFI is our Expanding Farmers Market Access Program. Um, through this program, we work with farmers markets to increase their capacity to serve as a vital direct to consumer market channel for small to mid scale farmers, um, as well as a invaluable community centers for local consumers. And so one of the ways that we support farmers markets is through supporting double bucks programs and markets. And these are programs where shoppers who use their SNAP benefits at the market can actually double their purchasing power. So if you use your SNAP benefits um, to buy $20 worth of produce, you can actually get $40 worth of produce. Um, and so these are some of the ways that um, Rafi has been uh, responding in this past year to some of the needs that we've seen through the pandemic. I'll pass it back to Jared. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so we've uh, covered uh, what uh, what level of food insecurity uh, North Carolinians face, uh, as well as the issues that farmers of color face, uh, and how uh, RAFI is well positioned to address these. Um, so given RAFI's experience working with churches, uh, farmers markets, and farmers of color, uh, we have developed the Farm and Faith Partnerships Project. Um, so this project is a collaboration uh, between the Come to the Table program at RAFI and our Farmers of Color Network, as well as our Farmers Market Access. Uh, the goal of the Farm and Faith Partnerships Project is to counteract injustices in the food system uh, that marginalize farmers of color uh, and rural communities of color by creating mutually beneficial and self-sustaining economic partnerships between farmers of color on the one hand and faith groups in their communities on the other. These relationships result in farmers of color gaining additional sources of income, increased access to new local markets, and rural faith community members and other community members as well, gaining increased food security and access to fresh, healthy food. Uh, these connections can look a lot of different ways uh, and can look different depending on the context, uh, but it could look like a group of churches coming together to form a food box purchasing group uh, to purchase from a local farmer, or like a church hosting a farmer's market in their parking lot, uh, perhaps in coordination with other churches in their community. Uh, through these farm and faith partnerships, congregations are able to participate in building a thriving local food system and economy while also engaging in relational ministry with farmers in their community. Uh, so for example, um, 
one way this could look uh, would be hosting a congregation-based local CSA. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, um, we'll see a brief description uh, of what a congregation-based local CSA can look like. Uh, CSA is an acronym that stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And a CSA is a way for farmers to have guaranteed income so that they know that there will be buyers for the produce that they're growing. Uh, so here, RAFI staff organizes leadership from a group of congregations along with organizing farmers of color in that same area uh, who are willing to participate. The congregations and farmer jointly commit to a specific purchasing amount over the course of the growing season, with RAFI staff coordinating the selection of appropriate food offerings, uh, creating the CSA agreement and food pickup and drop off logistics, farmer payment and other continued communications. Um, one way to think about this process is that it's similar to matchmaking. Uh, RAFI staff will be able to match congregations with farmers based on what the congregations need and what the farmers are able to offer. Uh, the advantages here for farmers are that uh, farmers are able to plan production, anticipate demand, uh, and they'll have a guaranteed market for their products, um, as well as receiving payment early in the season, um, and knowing that there's a market for the food that's being grown uh, and minimizing food waste. And for consumers, uh, this means that you'll likely receive very fresh food um, that's likely been harvested uh, the day before or the same day that you've picked it up. Uh, consumers are often exposed uh, to new uh, ways of cooking, new recipes and new veggies. Um, as well as being able to develop a, a direct relationship uh, with a farmer who grows their food uh, and being able to learn a little bit more about how the food is grown. Um, additionally, uh, while CSAs are one way this could look, um, we recognize that churches and faith communities uh, have a lot of imagination uh, and are in very different, unique circumstances. And so a lot, uh, I'm sorry, another way that this could look uh, would be congregation-based technical assistance. Uh, so here, RAFI staff uh, will field incoming requests and ideas uh, from local congregations regarding how they can engage in mutually beneficial, sustainable, and practical ways of partnering with local farmers uh, of color. Uh, and so we would work to identify feasible ideas, work with the local congregation to secure resources and partner with a local farmer and also offer logistical support. Uh, currently we have one uh, CSA project going. Uh, it's our pilot project the Wake County CSA. Um, so if we're able to move to the next slide, um, the Wake County CSA, our first pilot project, uh, will end up running for eight weeks uh, with farmers having planted in mid-February and deliveries going from May through June. Uh, with the CSA, we have currently eight different churches and over 120 people participating throughout Wake County. Uh, purchasing 80 shares, uh, and this is bringing in about $20,000 total in sales for three local farmers of color. Um, and I believe uh, Gary Smith, uh, Gary, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here. Yep. Hi, Jerry. Hey, um, so Gary Smith is a member at Community UCC, um, and he and his congregation uh, are a part of the Wake County CSA. Um, and Gary in particular uh, has been really instrumental in the formation of the CSA. Um, he's been someone uh, 
uh, who's done a lot of work and coordination uh, in making this CSA go. And uh, he's uh, been really instrumental in helping form it. Uh, and so we thought we would uh, give space uh, for Gary to kind of share his perspective and experience. Um, I, actually, I wasn't expecting that, Jared, but that's okay. Um, um, so I guess I guess my main comment was uh, would be that um, how um, wonderful it's been to develop relationships with the farmers and how uh, delicious the food has been. Um, everybody from the very beginning has been enthusiastic about it, both farmers and and the church members. Um, in, in my church, um, we're working with a farmer of uh, singing, singing stream farm as Ken Daniel. I think Ken is pictured with the microphone in, in that picture. I think that's Ken. Yeah. Um, uh, he's got a mask on, so that's why I'm not sure. Uh, um, anyway, it's been great to get to know Ken. Um, and uh, just to comment about the food, I was telling Jared yesterday or the day before that um, I was not a big fan of collards, um, but uh, somebody had put a, we, we, we've set up a, um, a recipe uh, sort of website where people can put down recipes and share them with the others in the group. And, and someone had put up uh, a recipe for uh, lasagna with collards. And we tried it at my house and it was delicious. And then I was hoping to repeat it the next week and there were no more collards. I was very disappointed. Um, and the other, the other recipe that, that I really enjoyed was uh, that again surprised me was a kale recipe for a kale salad. Um, Ken's kale is just delicious, it's tender. And uh, we made that kale salad. It was just, I was over the moon about it. Um, Yeah, so I guess that's all I had to say. Thank you, Gary. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, yeah, and sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, a CSA. Yeah, no problem. I, I, I'm a big fan of the whole process um, and I'm uh, looking forward to growing more and um, and getting to know uh, the, the farmers even better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, sorry, there is one other thing too. This is a great way for the churches to get to know one another. We're, we're, getting, we're getting to know uh, the other churches uh, and people in, in our local churches more than we did before in a new way. And that, that's a good thing, a great thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, that is definitely a benefit, um, getting to kind of expand your congregation's community and relate. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, so for the uh, Wake County CSA, um, we are currently in the process of uh, preparing for the summer season. Um, and so if you attend a church in Wake County and you're interested in joining, uh, please contact me um, and uh, we will reach back out and figure out if that would be a good fit. Additionally, we're also in the process of forming CSAs in Forsyth County as well as Chatham County. Um, and so if you uh, are connected with a church um, in any of those counties and you would like to be involved, uh, definitely please reach out to us, reach out to me uh, or Michelle or David, uh, and we can definitely uh, help you uh, get connected. Um, and in terms of what makes a church a good candidate for a CSA. Can I, uh, sorry, can I jump in real quick? Oh, yeah. Even if you're not in Wake County or Forsyth or Chatham, if you're um, interested in getting involved in this, um, just reach out to us. We're definitely wanting to form more of these as well. 